Um, thanks again for inviting me to uh, come speak with you today about negotiations. This is, a, I think, a critical part of running any small business or any business in general is having good negotiation skills. So um, for today, what I want to do is we're going to talk about a mindset for effective negotiations. We're going to talk about some factors that can derail your negotiations. And I'm going to walk you through a system that I use that will ground you in safe decision making in those stressful situations. Some conflicts of interest. I don't have any medical conflicts of interest. I don't work for any drug companies or, or uh, anything like that. I do uh, help small business owners uh, in the healthcare field uh, kind of attain the practice or the business that they desire. Um, today, what I'm going to teach you about is everything I learned from this man. His name is Jim Camp. He, uh, he was a, wrote two books on negotiation. I met him in 2010 when I was president of my uh, anesthesia group, and we were renegotiating a contract as an exclusive provider for this hospital. This hospital is a, a ch member of a chain of publicly traded hospitals, and it was uh, going to get a little dicey. Um, everybody was telling me it was going to be easy peasy, but in fact, it wasn't. I tried um, uh, using some of the negotiation stuff I learned in my MBA classes, and it just wasn't working. I began to research everything I could about negotiations, and I stumbled upon one of his books. Uh, I read it and began to apply it. And all I did was I simply emailed Jim, said, thanks for writing the book. This is how it's helped me. He emailed me back to my surprise. Those emails turned into phone calls. Eventually, I began to work with Jim and do workshops across the country with him. I still work with the company, even though he's passed on. We lost him to gallbladder cancer in 2014. But I always want to give credit to Jim. This is, in, this is his, his, some of his work, and I put my own spin on it. But um, uh, he's the one who got me started. He's the one who told me to write my own books and stuff like that. So I give him credit. Now, for the next 30 days, since I can't see you in person, if you go to my website, davidnorrismdmba.com slash Sanibel, I'm going to give you the checklist I use for my negotiations. You're going to get a copy of this slide deck that you can use at home or refer to anytime. And I'm going to give you an electronic PDF copy of one of Jim's books. I just want to give you resources so that you can then begin to use this information uh, and apply it. You know, I, I don't expect you to really kind of be able to go out of the gates after 40 minutes of talk. So I really am trying to give you some resources to empower you to do that. Okay. So if you visit that, it'll be up for the next 30 days. Now, August 16th, 1987, out of Romulus, Michigan, Northwest Flight 255 was getting ready to take off. This crew, uh, this was the third leg of this for this crew. They started out in Burbank, California, and um, they were getting ready to take off, head over to the East Coast. Now, when you fly for a big corporation like that, you get uh, what we call dispatch packets. That's where the company goes ahead and they kind of expect you what runways to expect. They also do all your calculations in terms of runway lengths that you need in order for you to take off. Dispatch told them to expect runway 21 left or 21 right. But instead, when they pushed back from the gate, ground cleared them for three center. Now, three center was the shortest runway on the airport. Now, this captain was 31 years of experience and his first officer had 8,000 hours. They went ahead and accepted the clearance and began to taxi to three Charlie. But what they had to do is they had to do those calculations, make certain that they could actually take off on that runway based upon their weight and configuration. They go ahead and then the tower clears them for takeoff. They take the runway and begin to proceed down the runway. They do lift off the ground, but only climbed about 50 feet. And they maintain the 50 feet elevation until about a mile down the run, uh, past the run of the runway where the wing strikes at a lamp post, causing the fuselage to crash and careen into a kiosk at a car rental lot. There were 149 passengers, six crew members, and 156 fatalities because of this. There's only one survivor, a small toddler. The NTSB did their uh, investigation and found that the probable cause of this accident was a flight crew's failure to use a taxi checklist to ensure that the flaps and slats were fully extended for takeoff. So what happened? Well, they were expecting one thing, two one left, two one right. They were throwing a curveball three center. It threw them off their game. Um, they didn't follow a systematic approach to get ready in order to take off, and it cost a lot of people's lives. 
The other thing they could have done is they could have told dispatch or they could have told the, the controller, we're going to reject, we're going to say no to that uh, three center. We, or we need time. We need another 15 minutes to do some calculations. But rather, they just accepted that and proceeded on. So any, you know, anytime we're flying, when I'm flying, you know, an ATC issues me a clearance or a command, I always as PIC or pilot in command say, no, I'm not, I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. Just because they tell me to do something doesn't mean I have to. The same thing occurs in a negotiation, okay? We sometimes feel that when they're made an offer or a demand that we have to comply. We have to be able to say no, and we need to stick to a checklist. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So why, are, why were we here? Well, I think very early on in life, we learn we negotiate just about everything that we want in life. We negotiate with our spouse, our children, patients, contractors, suppliers, partners, co-workers, and bosses, unless you're me, and these are the people I get to negotiate with. Now, being that we negotiate everything in life, there's oftentimes we are in negotiations, you know, whether it's a multi-million dollar contract deal that, you know, the group of uh, 80 families depend on a successful outcome, or if it's a contentious multi-party negotiation composing of my children and my wife and I debating where we're going to go to dinner, you're going to negotiate a lot of things in life, big and little. But the most diff dangerous situation you're going to find yourself in is being in a negotiation and you don't realize it. That happens more often than you might think. You know, when I was the president, I would get, you know, the CFO, CEO would just stop me in the hall or give me a call wanting to chit chat. But actually, I think they're probably searching for information, searching for data that they can use against me in the upcoming negotiation. So the most dangerous thing you can be in is in a negotiation and not realize it. But what is a negotiation? Well, we define a negotiation as the effort to arrive at an agreement between two or more parties with all parties having the right to veto. And it's the right to veto that defines a negotiation. If you or the other side does not have the right to veto, the right to say no, the right to walk away, we don't consider that you're in a negotiation. We think you might be in collective bargaining or you might be in a coercive environment or situation, but you are not in a negotiation. Now, when we're out in negotiations, we have to be real, uh, recognized there are predators out there. You know, why do the big beasts like this tiger or grizzly bears or wolverines or wolves, why are their eyes facing forward? Well, it's because they're predators and they're always looking ahead for prey. And much like human beings in the corporate world, they're looking for prey as well. And what do predators look for or how do they get their prey? Well, they usually prey on the weakness. If you ever watch a Nat Geo show and you're on the savannah and you're watching some big cat stalk some prey, who do they usually take down? They take down those who are weak, the old, the lame, the slow. And I think it's, it's a good analogy here because in a negotiation, being weak will make you vulnerable. And those predators are going to jump on that. So how do they do that? What makes you weak in a negotiation? Well, number one, it's your desire for money. It could be your desire for power or status. Um, they, uh, they will be masters at building that, identifying that weakness and building it up. So if, if you have a need and you feel that need for money or power or status, they may say things like, man, you, this is going to be great for your company. You're going to get a lot of kudos for signing this deal with us. Or, or they may say this contract is yours, you know, it's yours to have. We just got to go through the process. Um, you know, we're just going to rubber stamp it. What they're doing is they're building up your desire and your need for this deal. And then really skilled ones, after they've really fed your, your hopes and expectations, uh, they're going to they're gonna lower the boom. And they're going to come back with changes in expectations and other hosted demands. And why do they do that? Because they want you to be afraid to say no. They want you to have fear. They don't want you to exercise your right to veto. So Jim's first book was titled Start With No. And if you read about it, you know, and it, it, we say a negotiation does not end with no. A negotiation starts with no. OK, so anytime we hear a no, that's when the negotiation starts, because why are we going to negotiate after we hear a yes? We have agreement. We have a deal. 
Every negotiation starts with no. Now, an, another important a- aspect of starting with no is that it's not about us saying no. Now, we have the right, but that's not our tactic. What we want to do is we want to invite the other side to say no. Because when we say no, we offer them to say no and invite no in a calm, professional, sincere tone. It's going to do three things. Number one, it's going to lower their defenses. They're going to, when, when we're in stressful situations, human beings, our minds only have the processing power to do about seven, five to seven different things at any given time. And if I'm stressed or if I'm in uh, I fear for being taken advantage of, I'm going to devote more processing, more computing power, if you will, to watching out for traps and tricks you may throw my way. However, if I say, you know, I really, really want to want to help you. And if anything I say you don't agree with or you don't like the offer, simply say no. It's not going to hurt my feelings. It's not a big deal. I really want you to say be comfortable saying no. When we do that, it lowers the defenses. They're able to shut down some of those defensive processes and push them more towards being able to creatively see an opportunity and how to work together. Next thing it does is it builds credibility. It shows that you're open and honest. And then finally, and most importantly, it shows where you differ on issues. Why do you want to talk about what you agree about? I mean, that's what CNN and then Fox News are about with all the pundits. What you want to do is you want to discuss where you differ on issues. And inviting no is the best way to do that. Now, in order, in order to invite no, you have to be able to hear no. There are a number of lies we tell ourselves. We sometimes will say, if they say no, it means they don't like us. Wrong. Or they, uh, they may, my feelings might be hurt. It's over or I failed. Those are little lies that we tell ourselves that I want you to get away from. Write them down on a piece of paper, crumple them up, throw them away. Because those aren't true. And you also have to allow yourself to say no. These are little lies we tell ourselves. I'll be disliked. I'll hurt their feelings. I'll damage the relationship. I might come across as being mean. It's all over. The deal's lost and I failed. Those are all false. And one that they like to use a lot, a predator, is they'll stress the relationship. There is no relationship. All right. Um, the other day, a friend of mine asked, invited me to go golf, and I said, great, let's go. And he invited another guy, a friend of ours, who doesn't really like to golf. And the other guy, he was there. He said yes, but he was miserable. He didn't have fun on the course, and really, he kind of brought the rest of us down. What would have been better for the relationship was he been honest and said, no, I don't want to go play golf, right? Because now we're less apt to invite him to other things not involved with golfing. Does that make sense? That's just a friend uh, relationship. In a business relationship, you're not going to hurt, damage the relationship if you say no. So take these, th- these thoughts and eliminate them from your mind. Because what's worse, no deal or a bad deal? I'm going to tell you from personal experience, no deals better than a bad deal, no hires better than a bad hire, and no contracts better than a bad contract. Uh, I've had been in situations where we made a hire and we did it more out of fear and need rather than really make doing due diligence. And it created more pain and heart and suffering to get rid of the bad hire or get out of the bad deal. So <clears throat> if you've ever been in a bad deal, I want you to look back and think about some aspect of that deal because it probably involves one of these aspects. You accepted their, they accepted your first offer. You offered, countered, and you split the difference. You didn't ask any questions. They didn't ask any questions. Neither side tried to tweak the deal, or you only negotiated on one price. Now, when I look back on my bad deals when I was young, early in my career, a lot of them had some component of this, okay? But what I want you to become are effective negotiators. And effective negotiators have six characteristics. The first one is they have effective decision-making. What is effective decision-making? Effective decision-making is you make the best decision you can with the data you have while acknowledging the risks. And if new data arrives, you're not married to the first decision. You, you have the wherewithal and the confidence to change trajectory. It's no different than if I were going to take off in my, my little plane out of Wichita and fly down to Fort Myers for this, I would have planned a route, but maybe weather pops up, winds change. 
I need to change direction. I need to make a different decision in order for me to get to my objective, which would have been Fort Myers, Florida. That's what effective decision-making is. And in a negotiation, as you discover new information, you have to be adaptable. Next thing is that they're mission and purpose driven. They know exactly what it is they're doing and why they're doing it. And that drives every decision. That drives every conversation. That drives every question they ask. They also set valid behavioral and activity goals and objectives. They, they pick objectives that support the mission and purpose, and then they design and implement physical goals that support those objectives. They plan to identify and solve the real problem. Oftentimes in business, I've noticed the other side, the adversary, may not actually know what the real problem is. They may have a, they're, at, they're asking you to solve or treat a symptom rather than the root cause. OK, um, if you come into the ER and you have belly pain, I have to run a differential diagnosis. Is it gallbladder disease? Is it appendix, torsed ovary, kidney disease, kidney stone? It could be anything. My job as a physician is to figure out what the real problem is. But sometimes when we get into business uh, and we're doing these negotiations, they're presenting with symptoms and we think those symptoms are problems when in fact it's something deeper or it may be more complex. An effective negotiator wants to solve and identify the real problem. The fifth one is that they're incredibly focused and they stay focused on that negotiation throughout the entirety of that negotiation. And this comes into play because we live busy lives and oftentimes we'll have like a 10 o'clock meeting where we're talking about a negotiation and then we're gonna shift gears for an 11 o'clock appointment and move on to something else. When you're in that 10 o'clock meeting on that negotiation, I want you to stay focused the entire 60 minutes. A lot of times people will begin to shift gears and disengage in the last five, 10 minutes of a meeting so they can mentally prepare for what's coming up. And if you do that, you're at risk for missing important data or making bad decisions or giving away information you probably shouldn't have otherwise. So I want you to stay focused the entire time. And then they have a growth mindset. And this is perhaps the most important thing for effective negotiating is a growth mindset. Years ago, when I started working with Jim, this was the first topic he asked me to teach on. So when I was doing my research, I looked up the definition of a mindset. And the mindset definition was a set of established attitudes. And I thought, yeah, I know what an attitude is because I can identify it in my employees and children, particularly bad ones. Then I said, well, what is an attitude? Well, an attitude really is just a way of thinking or feeling. So your mindset is the way you think or feel about a person, place, thing, or event. And that's important because our thoughts and feelings precede our actions and emotions. Every action and behavior, everything we do and say is preceded, whether we're aware of it or not, by a thought or feeling. And that becomes real important when we're at the negotiation table because the way we think and feel is going to determine how we behave. Now, there are two types of mindsets. The first mindset is called the fixed mindset. This mindset says everything in life is fixed. Knowledge is fixed. Talent is fixed. Um, the pie is fixed. And when, when you have that fixed mindset, you tend to focus on yourself, your needs rather than your wants, and uh, you don't really focus on the other side. The other mindset is the growth mindset. This says that Everything can be improved. Intelligence, I don't have all the data, so I need to ask great questions. Uh, the pie can be improved. Uh, the opportunity can be improved. So if you walk into a negotiation with that mindset, you're more apt to focus on the real problems and try and make the best deal for the client or the adversary rather than a fixed mindset, which is more focused on you. Now, a fixed mindset isn't the opposite of a growth mindset. The fixed mindset is the absence of a growth mindset. Just like dark's the absence of light, cold's the absence of heat, thus is the way with a fixed in the growth mindset. Now, what is it that we really manage in life? What do we actually control? Do we control the results or the systems? Well, we control those systems, not the results. We manipulate systems to get the results that we want. A couple of years ago, they started doing ERAS at my hospital for cardiac. We were running lidocaine drips and ketamine drips and blah, all this stuff. And then we'd look at how those patients were doing post-operatively in the ICU. What was our incidence of cardiac instability? What was the incidence of hallucinations? And we tweaked those systems. So when we're negotiating, we don't renegotiate the results. We use a system and manipulate the system to get the results that we desire. Now, John F. Kennedy said, never let us negotiate out of fear. 
uh, but never let us fear to negotiate. And I think that's real important because um, how do we protect ourselves from our emotions, particularly fear? Well, we use a system, a systematic, logical approach because systems provide guidance in decision making and they also help reduce and control our emotions. When I was two weeks into internship, fresh out of med school, I'd just two weeks before I'd passed my ACLS class and I get called to the, ICU, to the ICU or the floor to do a, a code blue. Now, I was nervous. I was scared. What happens when we're scared and nervous? You know, our brains become bombarded with those emotions and they can cloud our judgment. So what did I do? I whipped out my little handy dandy card, ACLS card and ran through it. It provided me guidance in that decision making and also help reduce and control my emotions. Um, the other thing systems do is that they help reduce errors and provide safety. Before I put any patient to sleep, I do a machine checkout. I make certain I have everything I need. Um, before I go flying, I do a checklist on my airplane. And I do the same thing every time to the same airplane. I inspect the same parts time and time again. Why do I do that? Because I don't want to come up, fall out of the air and die. I want to be safe. Also, if you use a system consistently, it can change your mindset. A couple of years ago, uh, my wife came to me and she said, honey, you know, I love you, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I've never had a conversation that went well for me that began that way. I knew I was in for a doozy. She said, I'm concerned about your diet. What I want you to do is uh, you need to start eating healthy. I know they got junk food at the hospital, but I think you can still do it. I'm going to help remind you. So she set in place a system, put a post-it note on the uh, mirror that said eat green food. And every day she texts me before lunch. Don't forget to eat green food, fruits and vegetables. Now I had a fixed mindset. I didn't want to do it. But over time, using the system changed my mindset. Now I have a growth mindset about that. I try and eat a salad every day and get my fruits and vegetables. Same thing can happen. If you are on, don't want to negotiate, if you use a system, it can help you become a better negotiator and enjoy it. And when you enjoy something, you're apt to become much more talented at it. And then finally, a system helps you create a plan. You know, when I, before I do a cardiac case, I have a plan. I, I, I run through a checklist. Do I have this? Do I have that? Based on the patient's conditions, what drugs am I going to need to come off pump? Uh, you know, what's the TE going to show? Things like that. So what is the system? Well, the system is basically six parts. It's mission and purpose, it's our behaviors, it's the questions we ask, it's our budgets, our checklist, and our log. So let's start with mission and purpose. Now, mission and purpose is pretty simple. Mission is what it is you do, and the purpose is why you do it. So in my, my, my business life, my mission and purpose is this. My mission and purpose is to help other healthcare providers have the business they desire through business education. What is it that I do? I provide business education. I fill that gap that professional schools don't give you. Why do I do it? Because I want the other side, the, the client, to have the business they desire. Now, it took a long time to kind of develop that. Um, but once you do, every time I get you know, a headhunter calls and says, hey, you want to take this position, one of the first questions is, does it meet my mission and purpose? And anytime I go into a negotiation, I always have a mission and purpose and I refer to it. It's my guiding light, my North Star. Now to create a mission and purpose, it needs to be concise. It needs to be short, not a paragraph, just a sentence or two. It needs to be rooted in their world and in their problems. That goes back to that growth mindset. So if I'm focused on them, I'm not focused on my my sales numbers or anything like that, I'm really trying to solve their problems by leveraging what it is I do and why I'm doing it. And then finally, it always has to be written down. When we write things down, they take on a whole new life and meaning and become even more impactful and powerful. So when I work with clients, this is the first thing we, we do is we have you write a mission and purpose statement. So the next item were behaviors. What are some bad behaviors at a negotiating table that are going to derail your, um, your negotiations? Well, the worst one is neediness. And neediness is a way of thinking. It's the story you tell yourself. It's the emotions you feel. And most importantly, it's the emotions you display. 
by displaying neediness, those predatory negotiators are going to identify that need. And remember, they're going to try and exploit those in you and make it so that you cannot use your right to veto. So some of the most common ways that we demonstrate neediness is that we talk too much. Um, I had some partners who would talk and talk and talk. One thought if he made the point five times and they didn't agree, after 10 times, they'll agree. That's not the way it works. You just irritate them more. I had another partner who, who was fearful we were going to lose the deal. So at the negotiating table, they begin to offer up services that no one else in the group wanted to do. We didn't have the resources. He would try and make promises to sweeten the deal to keep them in. And all you're doing is you're giving away way too much, or you may give away too much data because you never shut up. Um, the important thing to do about that is uh, um, avoid talking too much, but if the other side's talking, let them talk. Okay. The next thing is the vocabulary you use. Now, this is really important. Um, this is probably the biggest way we show neediness. Um, I never want to hear you use the word need with a, a possessive pronoun, either plural or singular. You'll never, I never want to hear you say, I need, we need. It's always you, I want, we want. Okay. Because when you say the word I need or we need, so if a partner comes to me and says, Hey, David, I need this weekend off from call. You want to do a switch. I'm sorry. I'm human. It's natural human behavior. You need, oh, so the price goes up. The price varies when you use the word need. If you're buying and you say, I need, the price goes up. If you're selling, the price will go down. But if you say, I want, and you don't indicate that you need anything, um, your price is more apt to stay stable and where you want it. Now you can use the word need all day long when you're talking to them. Adversary, you need this, you need that, do that. But it's always, I want, I need. That's probably one of the most powerful ways you can really change how the other side perceives your neediness at the negotiating table. And then finally, rushing to close. You're gonna negotiate, um, you know, you're gonna say, okay, we. We've agreed to terms. You're going to send it to the attorneys. When can I follow up? You can follow up in a week. Okay, I will follow up in a week. You're not going to call every day. You're not going to be that used car salesman that says, hey, do you want to, are we going to close that deal? How's it coming? Um, you don't want to show neediness that way. You just say, listen, the contract's up in two weeks. And I, if you don't have a decision, we are going to exercise our right to veto and walk away. We're not going to do extensions or anything. That's not the way we do business. It's however you want to do it, but you don't want to show neediness by pushing and rushing to close and being a pester. Anytime you get excited about the success of the deal, be careful that you're going to show neediness at the table. Okay. Um, some very dangerous behaviors you may encounter in a negotiation. They come from the fixed mindset that you know everything or assumptions. And assumptions are the false belief that you know everything there is to know about the market, you know everything it is to know about the adversary, what they need, and you know exactly how that negotiation is going to go. You know how many times I've been in a negotiation that went the way we thought it would? Never. They always have something happen. And the other thing is, is the problem is out of, ex, uh, out of assumptions come expectations. And the problem with that is that if we have assumptions – and then we build expectations. We use those expectations as mile markers for progress. And if we have that fixed mindset and we're not willing to be adaptable, we're going to be able, either looking at, say, well, they're not meeting these expectations. Either they're doing something fishy and wrong or I'm going to lose this deal. And neediness will crop up. You'll display those behaviors of neediness and you'll weaken your position. And then the predator will take you. So in a professional negotiation, no negative or positive expectations are allowed, okay? Now, what are some good behaviors? First off, no talking. I don't want you to talk. You, you answer a question, you're polite, but you share information that answers the questions and then stops. You don't reveal too much information. Um, and it's okay to be silent. But get comfortable not talking because they'll want to fill the gap. And when they fill that gap, they're going to share information. The most important thing is never ask the unasked question. All right. So that comes from the ex uh, making an assumption. You know what they're thinking. You know what they're doing. I don't, I've been married to my wife for 20 years. She still surprises me. I had the assumption that uh, she never wanted to go to the steak place because every time I asked, she said no. And then the other night, 
I asked, where do you want to go? She says, a steak place. I live with the woman for 20 years and I can't get it right. What makes you think you know what the other side's thinking when you're in a business arrangement, okay? Never answer the unasked questions. It might come across as a statement like it did for us and my brother when we were selling our real estate package. They came with a low ball offer and the agents blathering on. I don't know how much you owe uh, from the properties blathering on. Now, I could have assumed that she was asking how much we owed, but that's not germane to the price of the value of, or the value of the properties. It shouldn't affect it, but that could be dangerous information. Next thing is I want you to have steady emotions. Don't be excited or um, uh, 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 sad or angry in the negotiations. I want you to three plus. Whenever you hear a yes, I want you to ask questions that vary and change a little bit around that yes, because we want to, it does two things. Number one, we want to confirm what type of yes it is. There are three types of yeses. There's a confirmation yes. If you ask me, are you in a thunderstorm warning in Wichita? The answer would be yes. Um, you want to identify if it's a counterfeit. Sometimes people say yes just to make you go away or they plan on, you know, pulling a fast one over on you. Or it's a commitment, yes. And it's, we want to confirm, we want to make certain we have a commitment, yes. And the other thing we do when we reinforce, we reinforce that commitment, yes, in their minds, it reduces buyer's remorse. I want you to blank slate. Don't walk in with any assumptions. I want you to be less okay. When you're working with people who are highly intelligent or have a lot of specialized knowledge, be less okay. Let them feel superior because one of the best ways for them to show their superior is to share information. And they may share things that damage their position or strengthen yours. So be less okay. You know, fumble around. If anybody's got to feel good about themselves, it's the other side. I want you to really listen. You know, you have two ears and one mouth. Use them in that uh, ratio. And then finally, take great notes. Taking great notes is going to help save your bacon in a negotiation because it's the hard part isn't necessarily the negotiation of the contract. It's the execution. And if you take great notes during the negotiation phase of it, you'll be able to rely on them when you go to execute that saved my bacon more than once. The other thing we want you to do is you gather information, know everything you can about your adversary, but you're going to confirm it. You can do web searches, magazines. If they're publicly traded, you can get all their financial information uh, from the feds. You know, you can get their 10 K 10 Qs. Uh, if they are even nonprofit, you can get their financial reports from the form 990 from GuideStar. That gives you information. Those reports tell you where they think their market's going, how their business is going to grow, and where they're spending their money and how much they actually have. Okay. Um, the next part of the system are questions. Now, the other side, they come to the negotiation expecting an argument, a debate. They're going to haggle. But what we want to do is you want to ask questions because it throws them off their game and gets you out of the offer counter offer game that you have. Good questions are the key to effective negotiating. And there are two types of questions. The first one are verb led questions. And these are, is this something that would work for you? Or would this be of interest to you? The problem with those is that they don't give us any data, any information. We can use these when we want to confirm a point, but that's not how we want to gather data or information because all we get are yes, no's, and sometimes maybes. And that doesn't share any real valuable, actionable information with us. And, if, and you definitely don't want a maybe because a maybe does nothing but aggravate you. And if you don't think a maybes are aggravating the next time the small child asks you to go outside and play or something and you, or they want a snack and you say, maybe watch how they behave. Watch what happens to them, okay? You don't want to ask those kind of questions as the primary way to identify pain points. Instead, we're going to use interrogatives. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. You know, how might this process or this service benefit your organization? Who would be benefited the most? How would it do it? Um, most often, you're going to use what and how as you're crafting your questions uh, in a negotiation. But really always try and you ask these kinds of questions rather than verb led. Now, when you're asking questions, be careful with the why uh, when you use it, because sometimes it can come across as an accusation. You know, um, I got better results when I asked my son, instead of asking him, why did you hit your sister when they were toddlers, to say, what led you up to 
what 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 occurred what caused you to guys get into this fight i got better data and i was able to get through to him that perhaps you know you might not want to do that but by asking what rather than why it it dropped his ego protective measures if you will um you might ask why would you ever want to leave or why do you want to work with us those are great why questions but just be careful with the word why now another behavior we want you to use at the table is called labeling this is where we spot their feelings and turn them into words and repeat them back to them this is a great way to kind of nurture them because that's one of the concepts we teach is we really want you to nurture the other side and this is a great way to do it it seems like it looks like it sounds like it seems like you guys are feeling or, or, or thinking this, or it, it sounds like you, you're kind of going down that path. It shows the other side that you're really listening and processing and trying to understand what they're doing. What you want to do is you want to avoid, I think this, or I think that, or I hear you saying, avoid I altogether. Just, just stay neutral and repeat their, uh, their emotions back to them. It's a great way to nurture them and get them to open up even more. And it also builds your credibility. Now, sometimes you're going to hear the F word in a negotiation. Um, and most often than not, it's used as a tactic against you. What you got to assume is not everybody has the same yardstick for what is fair. Okay. Um, and avoid projecting your values of fairness onto them. And just like you don't want them projecting their values onto you. Now, sometimes you may hear, you know, I just want what's fair. Um, that's really a tactic. Um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to manipulate your emotions uh, and your self-esteem because everybody wants to be perceived as fair. Uh, so it's a manipulation. Um, at the beginning of this negotiation, you've invited them to say no. You said you can say no at any time. I'm going to treat you fairly. If you do hear I just want what's fair, just say, okay, I'm sorry. Let's stop and go back to the point where I started treating you unfairly. What point in this this negotiation did that crop up? Because that wasn't my intent and we need to address that issue right now because I've been fair with you this whole time. The other time you'll hear it is we've given you a fair offer. Um, with that, uh, you just say, uh, that's great. I've been fair to you. Um, we both have the right to veto. It seems like you're ready to provide the evidence to support your claim because I have data and evidence that says, well, this is our value. If you have something otherwise, I'd love to see it. Do you know how many times I've heard that and I got the actual numbers from them? Zero. Um, they, oh, it's proprietary. We can't share that. Right, whatever. Uh, it's disregard it. And they usually change the subject. Okay. Now, emailing is, is the new method of negotiating, but it's incredibly, incredibly hard to negotiate by email. What I want you to do, rather, I want you to be face-to-face, -face, either in person or Zoom, if not over the phone. But it's a whole, so hard to negotiate by email because it gives them too much time to think, calm down, and recenter themselves. They can really control the amount of information they reveal to you in that email. <clears throat> because if, 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 if you remember, 7% of what we say, of what we communicate, is made up of the spoken words. 38% of what we say is based on the vo our voice, our inflection points, our cadence. That expresses 38, about 38% 38 of the total communication. And the rest, the 55% is nonverbal communication. It's our facial expressions. It's our body language, things like that. But when in an email, we lose everything but 7%. And in fact, even on text messages, the same way. Why, why is Apple with every OOS update, they add new emojis? It's because they're trying to re-inject some of that humanity back into that non-ver that in, uh, that ver non-verbal or uh, or that verbal communication. So negotiating by email is incredibly hard. I would say I do even negotiate by email, but it's usually to confirm something or to re you know to memorialize in a, a, what we just talked about. Always get them on the phone or do a face to face. Um, you're going to get a lot more information out of them that way. Now, when you're negotiating. You can be, uh, you might be ignored. Everybody's email box fills up. Provoke a no. You know, have you given up on this information? Don't be afraid to use your right to veto. And sometimes you have to force them into a no to get them to re engage. And a way to do that is to mislabel, intentionally mislabel their actions, emotions, or desires. Everybody wants to be understood. If you mislabel it, I guarantee they'll come back and say, no, 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 no. This is what, uh, this is what it is. It's a, it's a tactic to get them to re engage. 
Now let's get into the medical record of the negotiation. We're going to go through this part real quick. Before the event, you're going to go through your checklist. You're going to create a prep sheet. Everyone on the team shares it. After the event, you're going to go and create a log of what happened. So we're going to talk about the last two parts, the checklist and log real quick here. Um, so before I take off or do my anesthesia machine, I run through a checklist. I run through this checklist before I go through any negotiation event, whether it's an email, a phone call, or in person. I actually run through this, and this is what I'm going to give you. This is one of the downloads. I start off with my mission and purpose. What am, what's my, what am I doing and why am I doing it for the benefit of the other side? I want to refocus myself and confirm that. And then I write down the changes. You know, most importantly, I would say I write down the, who the decision makers are. Who's involved on their side and who's involved on my side? Have I included all the decision makers on my side? Or is there somebody who's going to sabotage the event because I didn't uh, necessarily uh, include them in on the discussions? Uh, then I create an agenda. This is what we're going to talk about. This helps me focus and prepare. I start with mission and purpose, and then I outline problems. I, uh, problem is nothing more that holds us back from a successful negotiation, okay? I identify them, write them down, and then I discuss them in the upcoming negotiation because I want you to be effective negotiators. I write down baggages. These are the uh, kind of the, the baggage we carry around from previous mistakes, either with them or with other providers like them, you know, we just want to identify those points and be aware that they may cloud judgment during a negotiation. I, most importantly, I write down what I want. If I'm going to make this phone call with Susie, I want her to schedule an appointment with a decision, this particular decision maker. That's a negotiation. If I don't have all that written down or I know what it is, guess what? I probably ain't going to get it. Somebody else will get what they want. And then I write down, I have a plan for what happens next. Um, and I make certain that they know, or we know. And then when we're on a team, we talk about behaviors. I reinforce, I need to take good notes and I want to control my behaviors. I want to use, I want, not I need statements. I make assignments and let experts talk to their areas. And then I craft three or five questions before I go into that talk or that, that meeting. Um, so I'm prepared. Afterwards, I write down the log. So like it's the H and P of the surgery, then the surgeon's op note. I write down who was there, what pain was discovered, I keep track of our budgets. Uh, I discover what new information about the decision-making process. I write down a summary of what the event was. And then I use all that to create the next agenda because this is a cycle. The cycle is a checklist. I execute, I write down the result of that execution, and then I repeat the process over and over and over again until I get to the conclusion of the negotiation. And I guarantee you, I mean, it, if you were to do this and you actually implement this written checklist log, you prepare this way, you're going to see dramatic results in your negotiations. Um, so remember, it all starts with mindset. I want you to be, be mindful of your behaviors, particularly demonstrating neediness at the negotiating table, using this checklist and making certain that you monitor and you're controlling your behaviors and the way you think and feel is a great way to begin to monitor and alter those behave, bad behaviors and create a plan to avoid missteps. So I, I, you know, hopefully you were able to understand the need for a structured approach to negotiations. Uh, we were able to discover how the way we think and feel dramatically impacts the encounter and um, uh, formulate and use this solid and successful model for negotiations. Um, again, if you visit David Norris slash Sanibel, you're going to be able to download the, uh, the slide deck, one of Jim's books and, uh, and my personal checklist that I use to prepare for each and every negotiation. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email, give me a call. I'm here to help. Um, you're not going to be able to get all of this done in a 40 minute talk, but I'm here to help you. And with that, any questions?